What's happening, everybody? Welcome into episode 35 of the Two Stripes Podcast, the podcast that covers everything going on in the college football landscape. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host, coming to you from Boulder, Colorado on Friday, August 18th, 2017. We are less than 10 days away from the start of the 2017 college football season. I couldn't be more fired up and happy to get another episode of the show out to you all. Before I begin today's episode, I just want to remind everybody where they can catch the show. First, you can go to soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod and find all the episodes there and subscribe over at Apple Podcasts by searching the two stripes podcast, find all the old episodes, subscribe like I said, leave a review, leave me some feedback, anything is appreciated. And if you like the show, tell your friends about it. You got family members or friends that like college football? Drop a line about the show. Tell them to check it out. Anything to help get the show out there is greatly appreciated. Jumping into today's episode and today's guest, I've previewed almost every team in the SEC at this point doing these off-season previews, but there's one I haven't really been able to get, and it's a team that I want to talk about almost more than any other SEC team that I think is going to have a very entertaining season and is kind of a wild card, not only this year, but every year. So with that being said, I'm excited to talk all things Auburn football with a man that covers Auburn sports for the Opelika Auburn News, which you can find at oanow.com slash au now, and his name is Josh Vitale. Josh, what's going on? Thanks for joining the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Auburn is a program I really love watching from afar, and it has this reputation as this roller coaster football program that things are either going really well or they're, the sky is falling and things are going bad. And if you look at last year, even there was that five game winning streak in the middle of the year, and then they lose three out of the last four games of the season. Do you think that's an accurate description of what Auburn has historically been and where it is now? It has been a little bit of a roller coaster recently, just because they've, you know, the end, the end of the day, they've only won seven or eight games every year since 13. That's been pretty consistent, but the way they've gotten to those seven or eight wins has always been a bit of an adventure mm-hmm. in the last couple of years. So yeah, it, it's it's been a little bit of a roller coaster, but this year it seems like they're going to try to hop off that roller coaster and, and have more of the season that Auburn fans are have been dying for them to have since 2013. How much of that fan consternation do you think is due to Alabama and how good that they've been in seeing what the Crimson Tide have done just down the road in, in the Nick Saban era. It definitely doesn't help Auburn. I mean, any any team with the history that Auburn has would be disappointed with three straight seasons of, you know, eight or fewer wins. That's just natural. But the fact that those three seasons, you know, Alabama has won three SEC titles, won some national titles, and been so successful so close by makes it, I think, that much harder to handle for an Auburn fan. So, it, it, I mean, it would people would be disappointed regardless because you want your team to do well and do better than eight wins a year. But having Nick Saban being so dominant so close does not make things any easier for Auburn. The big story earlier this week was that Baylor transfer quarterback Jarrett Stidham was named the starting quarterback by Gus Malzahn, which kind of seemed inevitable when he transferred in. But this was kind of the confirmation of that. What what were some of the things that the coaching staff said about what he was able to do to secure that job and why he won it? I think the biggest thing was he he came in with very high expectations given what he had done at Baylor and you know the ranking has a recruit coming in there and the success he had there. He came in during spring and kind of just owned the competition, owned the job. It, it helped him that Sean White, the incumbent starter, wasn't full strength, still dealing with that broken arm. They suffered in the Sugar Bowl. But Stidham came in, established himself as a leader. Guys immediately gravitated toward him, rallied around him. The play on the field was great the whole time. He played great on A-Day, threw for almost 300 yards, um, didn't get a touchdown, but rushed for one. And then they came back in the fall, and it was the same thing. There was no drop-off. There was no kind of fall away from what he did in the spring. He was as good, if not better, than what he was in the spring. And they just they saw continued progression you know, continue growth as a player, but also the leadership and kind of off the field workout that they wanted. It, it it sounds like 
you know, the way the way Gus Malzahn worded it was that Sean White didn't lose the job, is that Jarrett Stidham came in and just, just took it away from him. Well, he's going to be working with first-year offensive coordinator Chip Lindsey, who has experience at Auburn dating back to 2013, but came from University of Southern Miss and then Arizona State last year. And the talk, I think from the outside, and at least what I've read, has been about making the offense more balanced and, and wanting to be more balanced between running the pass. And Auburn has been so slanted towards running the ball with Malzahn. But everybody says that every offensive coordinator wants to be balanced. But from what you've seen, what, what do you think the identity of this offense is going to be, especially with a quarterback like Stidham, who kind of, not that he's a pro-style guy, but has a different sort of playing style than most other Auburn quarterbacks we've seen. Uh, it's still going to be the Gus Malzahn run principle offense. That's going to be the base of everything that Auburn does. Gus is giving up the play call and duty, giving up some control of the offense to Chip Lindsey, but Gus Malzahn is still the head coach. It's still his team. He got to where he is with that offense. But that being said, it's not going to be a case, I don't think, at least given just what we've seen you know, on a day, given what we've heard from players, from coaches, it's not going to be a case where Auburn's going to come out and run it almost 70% of the time like they did last year, like they have done the last four years. They're not going to be 50-50, but they're going to be closer to that number in terms of you know, the run in the pass because um, they know they have the two dominant backs in Carrion Johnson and Cameron Petway. But they also know they have a new coordinator with more kind of air raid parts of his offense, as well as a quarterback in Jarrett Stidham, who they think can really, you know, maximize that part of Auburn's game. So they're going to throw the ball more than they have, but they're still going to lean on that run game. Um, so it's going to be a mix of both, but it's they think it's going to help the offense take the step forward it needs to this season. Yeah, definitely not a bad run game to lean on, like you said, the two top options in Cameron Petway. He's a dude that I love. He's He just looks like a throwback guy. He wears the neck roll. He looks like he's Mike Allstott out there when he plays and then Karrion Johnson. And then you have a sophomore in Cam Martin who's flashed in limited time as well. And you pair that with an offensive line that brings back a lot of players. It's very experienced in, at least when it comes to the run game, can be pretty dominant up front. So it's, it's fair to say that that will still be the focal point of the offense. And even if Stidham ends up being a very good quarterback, that everything's still going to flow through that run game, right? Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna use the run game to set up the pass. But the way the way they figure it and the way the plan is kind of unfolded is if, you know, the run game is as good as it is, that's going to open things up for the passing game. And there were times last year, especially late in the season when Sean was hurt, you know, against Georgia, against Alabama, where there was really no reason to risk Auburn's passing game because it wasn't there because they didn't have the quarterback healthy to execute it so teams could really just you know pack the box and stop that run if Jarrett Stenham is healthy and playing up to his capability that's not an issue you can't commit eight guys to the run because Auburn will be able to throw it so yeah they're gonna the, the run game is going to be a focal point it always is going to be as long as Gus Malzahn's at Auburn but if they can add the passing element to it that's going to take that offense to a level where they I think it can compete in the SEC more than they have in the past few years. And there's definitely the talent out wide that maybe hasn't shown itself to its full potential yet because you look out wide at receiver and they have talented players like Nate Craig Myers, who was a touted recruit, Darius Slayton. How have the coaches kind of assessed their growth this offseason as players and as we get closer to the season what do you expect out of them and who do you think is going to step up out of that receiver group uh, yeah that that group's coming along it's not really proven on the field that's kind of the biggest question mark around it when you look at the guys coming back Darius Slayton is the leading returning receiver he had less than 300 yards last year they don't even have a senior in the, the oldest guy is Ryan Davis who's a junior slot guy so it's young it's unproven but the general feeling around yeah, yeah. the program from coaches, from players, is that there's a ton of talent in that group. They're still looking to see if they'll have that guy, you know, step up and be a number one receiver. Auburn would like to see that guy step up. Not sure who it would be. It could be Nate Craig Myers, who had a huge game uh, in the spring game. Darius Slayton's a guy that a lot of people really respect there. He's only a redshirt sophomore, but people have seen him step up as kind of a, a leader of that group. Kyle Davis is a ton of talent but missed the spring due to a personal issue uh, they have slot guys and eli stove ryan davis and will hastings who have all you know flashed so there are pieces there i think 
seeing how those pieces kind of stack up and create the passing attack, I don't think we'll be able to see that until the, the season rolls around and they actually start playing the games. It seems like that would be the thing to put the offense over the top because, granted, we haven't seen Stidham in the SEC. We did see him as a productive freshman at Baylor, and then you pair that with maybe the best running back group in the whole SEC, if not the country, and an experienced offensive line. And it seems like this is Auburn's best chance to be its most well-rounded on offense in the Malzahn years. Yeah, Gus Malzahn has been pretty clear about saying that he thinks this offense has more depth than any Auburn offense has since that 2013 team, you know, with Nick Marshall, with Mason that, you know, won the SEC championship and made it to the national title game. Obviously, it's very lofty praise. That was a great Auburn team. But just on paper, if you go down the list of offensive positions, you see that. I mean, you have two running backs, who one who did rush for 1,000 yards last year, one who came 100 yards, within 100 yards, doing the same thing. Yeah, the wide receiver group we talked about, Jarrett Stidham, the starter, and Sean White being his backup. That's far more QB depth than Auburn's had in the last two years. Um, and in the offensive line, there are still eight guys they're looking at as potential starters. Not because no one has stepped up. It's because there are eight guys I think are talented enough to start right now, and they're just trying to figure out who the best five of those eight are. Looking at the defense and switching to them, you take a look at that defensive line, and they lose and Carl Lawson and tackles Montrevious Adams and Maurice Swain, but they bring back a bunch of young players just like at receiver that have this high recruiting pedigree and are very talented. How have they looked during the offseason and in fall practice so far? And is the most important thing for this defense going to be whether those players can step up into that role or not? The, the defense looks very good. And, you know, I think the common thing you hear from people, you know, outside of the program is that the idea of a drop-off because they lost to Carl Lawson and because they lost to Montrevious Adams, who were two dominant forces on that defensive line. But being around Auburn's team and talking to players, talking to defensive coordinator Kevin Steele, they don't believe any sort of drop-off is coming. Uh, they believe they have more than enough pieces to replace what they lost in Carl Lawson and Montrevious Adams. Uh, they have Jeff Holland, Paul James III, Big Cat Bryant at Buck, at defensive, in at, um, in the defensive tackle. They have Derek Brown and Andrew Williams, who are two younger guys who they're very high on. And then look behind them, the secondary returns pretty much everybody. Uh, the linebacking core, core returns absolutely everybody, plus adds a few big freshman recruits. The defense, talent-wise, might even be deeper than it was last year during that kind of breakout season. So they don't they don't feel like there's going to be any sort of drop-off coming with the defense. Looking at those linebackers, the top three guys in Darrell Williams, Deshaun Davis, and Trey Williams are all back, like you mentioned. Do you think that the strength of this defense is going to be them and their ability to kind of captain that defense, for lack of a better term? Oh, 100%. And it's kind of funny because you look back to last year at this time, we honestly had no idea who Auburn was even going to play at linebacker. I mean, Trey Williams had 55 tackles uh, in 2015. Deshaun Davis and Darrell Williams, I think, had six between them, and they were mostly on special teams. I mean, they, they had no experience at linebacker. And now they have those three guys, plus Montavious Atkinson, who they consider a starter, even though he didn't start a game last year. They feel like they have four starters at linebacker, and they typically only start two You know, in the in the nickel defense they usually play. So... That's going to be the focal point. Um, those guys are the leaders. Those guys are kind of in the middle of everything. And they feel like that group is going to be better than it was last year, which is saying a lot. Backing them up is a really active secondary, and I really enjoy watching these kids play. Carlton Davis is one of the most active corners in the country. And then you have safety Trey Matthews. And in a piece that you wrote the other day, defensive coordinator Kevin Steele is very high on Ohio State transfer corner Jamel Dean, who's dealt with knee injuries the past couple of seasons. What's the outlook for this group, and what can you expect out of them this season? Secondary is probably, I would say, the biggest question mark Auburn has on defense, and not because of the guys they're starting, because they feel really good about those guys, the Trey Matthews and Stephen Roberts at safety, Carlton Davis and Javaris Davis probably at cornerback. But you know, there's still a lot of moving pieces because Auburn's thin at safety. There's not a lot of guys behind the, you know, the top two. So they're moving a lot of guys around. They might put Jamel Dean, like you mentioned, at corner and shift Javaris Davis, who started at corner last year. They might play him at nickel. Uh, some of the guys are looking at a nickel, a Danny Thomas, a Jeremiah Denson. They might play them some nickel, some safety, just to provide some depth 
Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces in that secondary still, but they believe the talent is there. I mean, Carlton Davis, I think they can leave him alone on a receiver or on the side of the field, and he'll lock down that guy. Uh, Javaris Davis was freshman all SEC last year. Uh, Jamel Dean, they think, can be a huge talent if he can stay healthy and play, which as of right now, he's on track to be. They get Jeremiah Dinson back, who missed all last season with a knee injury. Daniel Thomas flashed as a freshman last year at the end of the season, picking off Jalen Hurts twice in the Iron Bowl. And there's a lot of pieces back there. Uh, it's just a matter of getting them in the spots where they'll be more su- most successful when the season starts. Looking at the schedule, the big matchup, at least early on, is that Week 2 showdown against Clemson in Memorial Stadium on the road. And we saw last year that Auburn was able to defend them very well. Do you think that, because at least from my perspective, no matter what happens in that game, whether Auburn wins or Auburn loses, things are probably going to get blown out of proportion. Either it's Auburn wins and they're a legitimate national title contender or Auburn loses, depending on what how it happens. And, oh, it's same old Auburn, they're going to lose five games. Do you think that maybe that game's probably going to get a little bit overrated in terms of its importance and how good this Auburn team is by the end of the year? You could say overrated, but I don't think you can overrate him like that that early in the season because, you know, even if Auburn's going to beat Georgia Southern week one, they're going to beat Mercer week three. But being 2-1 and one with that loss to Clemson, that's not, you know, that's going to set this team back from where it wants to go. You know, if it wants to get the SEC championship, and against Clemson's not going to matter I mean, in the scheme of things because it's going to be SEC standings, obviously. But, you know, that game is huge for momentum. It's huge for what happened last year. Um, given the way they almost they they played awful and almost beat the defending national runner up, they lost by five points in the end. I think that's a huge game for Auburn. You know, in the grand scheme of things, it might not matter by the end of the year, but for what Auburn wants to do, they really need to win that game. Do you think that, and this is something we talked about earlier, you look at the five game win streak last season and then closing out the season with three losses in the last four games is consistency something that's being preached about this team is whether they're up or whether they're down just trying to keep it more level than it has been in the past it's not really consistency you look at those wins and losses last year the entire thing was quarterback and they won six straight games sean white was the quarterback he played great through that whole winning streak and then he got hurt and the backups they had behind him were not capable of playing up the level and keeping the offense going at the level that it had been and it cost them it cost them huge. I mean, they they were a win at Georgia away from playing Alabama basically in a de facto SEC West title game. And, you know, then you lose Sean White. They lose to Georgia. The Alabama game means nothing. And they get blown out. So really, it's quarterback health. And that's where Malzahn's depth comments ring the most true. Um, you look at what they have. I mean, Sean White played great for this offense last year and he's going to be the backup this year and they think Jarrett Stidham's going to be even better than Sean White was last year so if Stidham's healthy they're going to have that and even if Stidham gets hurt they'd feel comfortable saying hey Sean White was the is the backup we feel comfortable having him run our offense so the, the biggest thing for Auburn is not consistency they were fairly consistent at, toward the end of last year it was just they weren't able to be you know keep doing what they were doing because they lost quarterback in that you can't you can't have that happen. What do you think a best case scenario for Auburn is this year? Best case, and this is what I've been saying pretty much the whole summer, is that the Iron Bowl at the end of the season is played with a berth in the SEC championship game on the line. Um, I think the floor for this Auburn team should be nine wins this season. I think they can win as many as ten, um, if not even eleven during the regular season. They'll 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 drop one at some point. Even the best teams do usually. This is a team that feels like it has, you know, a chance to compete for a, a conference championship and maybe a berth in the playoff. And on paper, that's true. Now, obviously, on paper means nothing in a couple months. If there's injuries or if they have a bad loss, everything will change. But on paper, this team feels like it can do that. And I think, I think nine wins and at least a shot in that Iron Bowl to get to Atlanta I think should be the floor. Yeah, you said that the nine wins is the floor. So you think that that, at the very least, is a fair expectation of this team. Anything below that, are we talking Gus Malzahn out at Auburn? Or, or what What do you think will be the case in that scenario? I think if Auburn loses, if Auburn wins eight or fewer games, Gus Malzahn's seat's going to heat up. I'm not willing to speculate right now whether that means he's out of a job or not. But 
the conversation would definitely be started because, you know, last year it's easy to kind of on the quarterback that was bad. Sean Mike got hurt. That stuff kind of happens. You can't blame a head coach for injuries, but you can blame a head coach for depth if there's not enough quarterbacks to be able to run the offense. This year, right now, there are enough quarterbacks. There are enough pieces for this team to get over that win threshold that it hasn't since 2013. So they're going to have to make this season kind of pan out the way it, it should look like it's able to on paper, or if not, the, the questions will definitely start you know, coming in hot. Well, regardless of what happens, Auburn is always entertaining, whether it's win or lose. And if you want to follow along with any of Josh Vitale's work, you can do so by following him on Twitter at AUBlog. Following all of his work also at the Opelika Auburn News by going to oanow.com slash AU now. Josh, thanks for joining the show and talking to Auburn. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. Big time thank you to Josh once again for joining the show. Auburn's going to be an extremely entertaining team to follow this season. And they have a legitimate shot. I know we previewed Arkansas last week and said that they could finish second in the SEC West. I think LSU could too. But Auburn, their team, if for lack of a better term, if they have their shit together, they should be up there with Alabama competing for that spot late in the season. I Like I've said before, I still don't know if anybody, including Auburn, has the talent to beat Alabama, not only in the SEC West, but in the SEC in general. But if there's a team that can, I think that it's Auburn. And now that they have a quarterback, now that the offense should hopefully be a little more settled, they can get some good wide receiver play, have some guys stretch the field. I think that this is going to be the most complete offense that Auburn has had in the Gus Malzahn era, or at least it should be given the talent on the field. So excited to watch them offensively. And then they have enough players on the defensive end and a lot of young, highly touted guys that maybe haven't made a huge impact yet, but have that big time pedigree that they should definitely be able to feel the strong defense, just like they were last year under defensive coordinator, Kevin Steele. So excited to watch Auburn this year. That's probably a good place to wrap up today's show. want to thank Josh Vitale again for joining. Make sure to catch all of his work at the Opelika Auburn News. Follow him on Twitter at AUBlog and drop him a line. Keep up with everything going on in Auburn football by following him this season. Also want to thank you, the listener, for taking time to check out the podcast. Be sure to subscribe. Go to Apple Podcasts. Search the Two Stripes Podcast. Find all the old shows there. Subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends about it. If you like college football, if they like college football, spread word about the show. Any help putting the show out there is greatly appreciated and helps more than you think. Also, go to soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod. You can listen on your desktop computer, your laptop. You can download the SoundCloud app on your phone and listen mobily that way. There's tons of ways you can listen to the show. You can go to my YouTube channel. If you search Colton Denning, all the old shows are uploaded to my YouTube channel. So check that out there as well if you're looking for different avenues to listen to the podcast. And then also you can follow me on Twitter or send me a tweet about what you think about the show at Dubsco. That's D-U-B-S-C-O. You can catch me on Twitter there. Until next time, though, I want to thank you all for listening to the show. My name is Colton Denning. And this is the Two Stripes Podcast.